Hello, hello, beautiful people. Scorch the Fears, episode 53. We got the great Jeffrey Donis. He's a really cool guy. I've been following him basically since we started around the same time. I went into way straight into like single family wholesaling flipping. He said he was interested in wholesaling for a while and he said, screw it. I'm just going to go into multifamily immediately. So I thought it was pretty cool. I wanted to have him on, hear his story, hear what he does with multifamily and all of that type of stuff. So Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming on and you're, probably, you're very well going to be here. So first off, actually, I should start with this. Tell, tell people like who you are, what you do, yeah. all of that type of stuff for to start it off. For sure, man. I appreciate you having me on. I love the intro. Uh, very lively. Yeah, my name is Jeffrey Donis. I'm 21 years old. I live in Durham, North Carolina. I got started in real estate about three years ago with my two brothers uh, with the initial goal, and it still is the goal, is to retire our single mother. Uh, my mom is from Guatemala, so I grew up in a low-income uh, single mother household, grew up playing soccer, and went to college for about a year. In the COVID pandemic hit, and that's when we actually got started in real estate and started our journey. We started out in wholesaling, as Jonah mentioned. It was just a lot of like hustle. We were cold calling, uh, doing different strategies like creative financing, joining different mentorships. And that first year, we did a decent amount of deals, deals and learned a lot, which we're very grateful for. But we realized the scalability of the single family space uh, wasn't what we were looking for. So eventually, mm -hmm. we decided to transition into multifamily, uh, which was a year, about 13 months into real estate. Uh, we ended up just deciding that multifamily was the thing we wanted to get into. But we didn't understand how because, you know, we thought we, there was a lot of the big beliefs. And I know that your, your show is big on that. So uh, we realized that we needed to find a mentor and eventually join a few mastermind groups. To fast forward, now we're apartment syndicators. A syndication is when you purchase something and raise money from a group of investors, and then you go and buy it. So for us, it's an apartment. Uh, we'll find the deal after underwriting it. We'll then go and raise the capital from our private network of institutional or retail investors, and they'll get a return on their investment for doing that, plus other benefits that we can go into. Uh, but the goal is to hold on to the property for five to six years uh, to then sell or hopefully you know, hold on to it forever. But that's really the, the gist. I personally focus on investor relations and capital raising for our team. I have two brothers, as I mentioned. One of them does our acquisitions and asset management. The other one does our marketing. Our criteria is 100 to 250 units, B class, 1980s vintage, which just means when the property was built, 1980s or newer in North Carolina markets or Atlanta. So we're very active in the space now. We've done about five deals, currently working on our sixth. Um, oh, it's yeah. over a thousand units, but we're like partners on the first, on all of them are partners, right? You don't own, I don't personally own any of these by myself. I think that's awesome about the multifamily space that you get to partner with team members and kind of split up the tasks. And obviously that, that comes with splitting up the equity, but happy to add any value. And I appreciate you having me on, Jenna. Yeah. No, I mean, hundred percent. I mean, that's the whole point I think of real estate in general is like having partnering up with people that like can do it more than you. I think it's, I don't think any, I, I think almost nobody should own real estate by themselves. And I don't know if I you know what I mean, but in the sense of everyone should have partners always, right. in my opinion, to split up the tasks, right? If you're freaking like trying to do it all on your own, you're going to get nowhere real quick, right? right? Like you're going to just be doing nothing all the time. But let's go back to your mindset barriers, man. I mean, I'm curious because it's such an interesting journey of like what you were guys were thinking about. You're 21, which is insanely young. Like, I love the fact I've been interviewing people who are like in their tw like 20 or 21. And it's crazy seeing you guys like, just absolutely crushing it at that age. I feel like I'm young. I'm 27. But like seeing yeah, 20 right. or 21 year olds, that's crazy. So like, good on you guys. What were your mindset barriers when you were starting? What do you feel like was holding you back? Whether it was right when you were starting wholesaling or for multifamily, like talk to us, to us a little bit about that. For sure, man. So initially just getting into real estate, I think, and then this happened for both the single family space when we were first getting into wholesaling and then even worse when we got into multifamily, which was the imposter syndrome, which I'm sure Jonah, you faced as well. When you're going mm -hmm. into this at a young age or just when you're brand new and perhaps you don't have a lot of money. Personally, I was obviously young. I didn't have a lot of money, didn't have any network or connections in the space. So right. I lacked a lot of knowledge, right? I had never done a deal before. So I didn't necessarily have the confidence going into it. And those were all things that were literally just 
beliefs in my mind. Now, for good reason, like they, they weren't just, I wasn't a crazy person for thinking all of those things. But eventually you just realize that those things are just beliefs and that's it. And if you just kind of can overcome them and just realize that they're just going to get in your way, there's no point in having them. Understanding them, like understanding why they're there, but then on top of that, just pursuing past them was what allowed us to move forward. And uh, we did that by just take by taking action. So really a lot of people in this space think that you have to know people or stuff like that. I, like I said, my mom, she cleans house. I didn't say this, but our goal is to retire her. And she grew up just hustling. She cleans houses and things like that. Had no network prior personally to real estate. And it was just by hustling, going to events, uh, going to conferences, getting on podcasts, making a lot of calls. That's how we were able to get into the wholesaling space on top of uh, eventually you know, buying apartments. It's all just hustle and taking massive action. Gotcha. So is your why mainly your mom? Like, what is your guy's why? And also give us a little bit of the origin story, because it's kind of cool. You have two other brothers and you guys found out about real estate. How? Like, how did you guys even get into real estate? That's the first why is to retire my mom. But on top of that, like, we have investors now that place their capital with us, which we don't take lightly. We're very grateful and fortunate to have those investors that trust us. Our goal is to not only help them build a life by design, but we want to inspire others through podcasts like this and platforms like that to start investing in real estate and just to build that financial independence that we're not only building for ourselves, but we want to help other people do it as well. But in regards to going back to when we first got started, I was a freshman in college about three years ago. And my older brother, he was the one that first heard about real estate. He's 24 now, but I want to say he was like 20 or 21 and I was 17. Um, so he's three years older than me. And he was sitting in his college dorm room. He was watching The Breakfast Club by a guy named Mark Witten. Have you heard mm -hmm. of The Breakfast Club, Jenna? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. God, what's his name? The God something? You know what's the God or something? Yeah, I'm forgetting yeah, it right now. Like, uh, Charlemagne, something Charlemagne. like that. Charlemagne. Yeah. No, it's Charlemagne the God. Yeah, yeah, him. Um, he's in, in, on the show, he brought on an African-American guy who was doing wholesaling at the time. And he was like, I'm a minority. I come from the hood. Like, I don't have much. I didn't start with much. And now I'm, you know, I have a multi-million dollar company in real estate and it's helped change my family forever. And my brother really resonated with that message. So he started looking into wholesaling. He learned more about it. And the guy told him, I don't know if the guy told him or eventually he came across Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is right behind me. My brother told me to read that book. I read it. And then after that, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. I'm sorry. I read Rich Dad Poor Dad first and then read Think and Grow Rich. And mm -hmm. at the time, that's when I got that bug. And I'm sure you got the same bug, but we kept- Yeah, it starts with the books. 100%. And then podcast. Yeah, we were like crash coursing the Bigger Pockets podcast, wholesaling, wholesaling elite. I think it was what it was called by Brent Daniels uh, with TTP. And we just kept learning. That was the one thing that we've never stopped doing either. But we just kept learning, and then we hadn't taken action yet, which is like the first part of the story was the educational process. But we were in that paralysis analysis stage, which I think a lot of people stay in. Uh, we eventually went to Guatemala, which is where my mom is from, for the first time, and that I was reading a lot of books while I was there. And my family, they come from a very humble background. So like I was staying with them for three weeks and it was small things like having to heat up the water to take a hot shower and to flush the toilet, right. and dump water in the, the thing. And it was very different. Like I won't go into the details, but it very, very different. And I was came back a different person in my opinion with a bigger perspective on the opportunities that I had here because I understood that all of the opportunities that I had, I was taking for granted before. So when I got right. back, we stopped like making excuses. My older brother, uh, he was the one that kind of started pulling lists of data, but we were all cold calling. So uh, we were in our dorm rooms when we got back. That was winter break, right? Winter break of my freshman year. We went to the trip, came back. Now we're in our dorm rooms and we're all full-time college students, about 18 plus credit hours. And it was about two hours a day that we would each use the same dialer account, Mojo Dialer. And we would just alternate. Wow. With two hours from like five to seven, I would call, then go grab dinner. And I was I was a pretty good student in college. I won't say high school, but in college I was good. So I'd study a lot too. So I really didn't have much time for much else. And two hours a day on top of that, my older brother was doing the same thing and he had a car. So he was driving around properties. He was like our boots on the ground guy, actually going mm -hmm. and meeting with sellers. Then the, the COVID pandemic hit and we hadn't closed a deal up until this point. Six months in, we were at home now all together. And school slowly started to become less of a distraction, I will say, because I eventually didn't go back. During that summer that I was supposed to go back to school, I closed on my first deal with my brothers. We closed on two deals, yeah. first day, but it was the biggest deal that we did. They were both wholesale deals, and it was that proof of concept that we needed. I just got really excited about real estate and was like, 
I really love this concept. I'm reading more books than I've ever read in my life, and I'm excited about reading again. I, I honestly, school taught me to hate to look to read and learn. It will, that's not their fault. I'll blame myself. Like I won't be a victim, but I realized that I, I can just go a non-traditional path and really take a lot from what I'm learning on my own versus what I was learning at school, and I can always go back. So ended up not going back the next year, and that's how we got started. Love it. Yeah, man. I mean, also, like, it's not everyone's supposed to go to school. Like, I, it doesn't really matter. It's like you yeah. you found your path, and that's all that matters. I'm curious, what's it like working with your two brothers? Because, like, I've, I've interviewed two brothers who they're, like, twins, and that was, like, really yeah. interesting to hear. But you have three all together, three business yeah. partners and your brothers. Does, like, the old argument over the toy set come up? How does it work? Like, how, how do the dynamics work? Yeah, just a, a little bit about that. Yeah, so surprisingly, my older brother, um, I don't, I don't like, he's not here to defend himself, but he's like <laughs> a visionary, big visionary, and I, we like to say he's like the crazy one. So he'll come up with the crazy ideas. My my twin brother and I were more of the breaks. So my, my other brother, he's uh, my twin brother. We're both more logical than, than my other brother. My other brother just thinks crazy. So what we'll do is like he'll come up with these crazy ideas and we'll kind of put the brakes on it. And it's just like a, the dynamic is there's three of us, which is awesome because it's an uneven number. So when we have mm -hmm. something at the end of the day, we'll come up with a vote. It's always about like debating. So if we have something we don't agree on, it's fine. If you can make a logical argument behind it, then we'll, we'll have that discussion. And it's awesome working with them because one, we come from the same background. Obviously, we grew up together. So we share that and we understand like our morals values are very aligned on top of that we have similar whys right retiring my mom building a great company helping people and then when it comes to like small things like if i if we get into a fight if it was another business partner i know it would be different because i can't just say what what i want to say without thinking of how i have to word it so i don't hurt their feelings at the end of the day we have unconditional love for each other so they know i'm not trying to like if i'm being like a douche then they'll they'll be mad at me, but they will get over it. Uh, they won't take it to heart, and you know it'll be like a lasting thing that bleeds into the business. It'll just go away. So those are some reasons why I really enjoy working with them, and I'm blessed because we also have the same work ethic. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that helps us grow our business at the pace that we're growing it at. Uh, we're all in alignment with where we want to take the company, as I mentioned, and that doesn't come with a lot of sacrifice in regards to who you're spending your time with. We're all single and we did that intentionally. Things like small things like that and working from like nine to nine most days, right? Because you love what you do. It's hard to find business partners that are all in alignment with that. And then you can cut me off if I'm speaking too much, but we, we live together too. So it's a constant mastermind. Oh, which, whoa, you live together? Yeah, man. It's a constant mastermind. Like even when I'm walking my dog, I'm, I'm, I'm with my brother and you can say it's bad now that I don't spend a lot of alone time. I think that's the only downside, but I'm always talking about life concepts business concepts it's all all non-stop and i love the mastermind because i could speak out loud and i have someone who i like to think you know is like-minded and not like the, not in all the senses but in certain senses where they can carry the conversation and we kind of bounce ideas off of each other and this is all the time so i think you learn a lot by doing that and you grow as a person where you can actually speak out loud on what you're learning and i'm obviously always reading books and listening to podcasts so i just have new things i like to talk about and it's great to have people to do that with yeah, no, I love it, man. No, it's pretty cool to see what, um, obviously the pros, it seems like is you guys all work together, your brothers. So you guys all like each other, which is freaking awesome. What are their cons? Cause like, I mean, I've, you know, like I hear from notorious BIG don't mix blood and money, right? Like what are there, are there any cons that you would see that you've had with working with your brothers? And then you kind of went over the pros, but just like, is it like yeah. you get annoyed at each other sometimes? Or what do you think? Because that's like, I would imagine it's just like, like you're literally every single second yeah. almost doing stuff no, no, together. That's point. I'd say the only, it's hard to think of, of one, but when I, what comes to mind is when you're working with the people that you like grew up with and you love, and now you're trying to separate being a brother versus being a business partner, it kind of becomes the same thing, which I can only see that as like a good and bad thing, right? So the bad thing would be it's hard to separate business and then time for family. So we almost always like, that's the first thing I go to. So like with one of my, my older brother, for example, typically our conversations are always the business or like our goals and things like that, which I can even argue and say that's a good thing or a bad thing. Depends. That's why, I don't know. Right now that's kind of our focus and I can see why that'd be a bad thing, but that's probably the only thing. And honestly, I don't mind it too much right now. Love it. So what were your guys' fears when you were just starting out? Like, let's say, I mean, you just started, you're still in college, you've done a year, 
right? Like maybe you've read some books, but like yeah. COVID hits, you don't know what's going on with the economy. You have no idea what you're doing. Like what's going through your mind? What's happening there? Yeah. So when we were first just getting started, it, it was the fear of rejection was the first thing we had to overcome. So obviously when you're cold calling, you're getting cursed at. And I know, you know, <laughs> uh, we were yeah. getting told no all the time. That quickly went away with like the first thousand calls, which we made very fast. On top of that, eventually leaving school, that was very scary because my mom, as the, you know, kind of coming from an immigrant background, her dream was for us to go to college and graduate, which I completely understand. And it was hard, hard decision for us to make, but that was something that I was scared of because once I let that go, I felt like I was going against what I had been groomed from day one. I went to, you know, K through 12. I knew I was going to college or so I thought. So that was something that was hard and is scary for sure. But I, I mean, as I mentioned, I was reading a lot, man. So, and I still do. That's the thing that I think that people really need to take away is like, you have to be a lifelong learner, which I'm grateful and blessed to, to have been able to read a lot of books recently. And some of the books while I was reading helped really helped me through that thought process, which was if something scares you, as long as it's like, you know, it makes sense, it's typically going to help you grow. The thing that scared me was dropping out of school. And I was looking at the path that I was looking to go on because I hadn't started yet. And I was like, this is something that excites me. It's going to challenge me and it's going to help me reach my financial goals, which is to help my mom. And she doesn't see that right now, but I have faith in it and I know it's going to work. So I'm going to take that leap of faith. That was scary. On top of that, going to these events, I was like 19, 18, had no money, but I'm like surrounded by real estate investors and they're all older than me by, by far. So that was scary because I walked in not knowing what to expect. But the one thing I've, I've always been good at and I learned it in high school was just going up to people and not being afraid to talk to them. It's a very small, simple thing, but I guess you can call it like an extrovert, but I still think it's just like a skill that you develop. So like I would go to a lot of gatherings in high school. I would just be like the only person that from my certain school at this gathering. And I just have to, you know, either make friends or it'd be very awkward. So I would just kind of put myself in those uncomfortable situations all the time. And I learned small things like how to start conversations, how to get people talking, how to make friends with people. And I use that skill immediately I was still kind of just left high school. I was now at these real estate conferences though. It wasn't like a high school gathering. Now I'm at a conference. I apply the same skill and slowly you just start having conversations with people and slowly you start building your network of millionaires and you know real estate investors. And that's something that really helped me. I was scared to do it, but as I started having these conversations, it helped me overcome that imposter syndrome because now you see these real estate investors in person, face to face, you realize that they're just people too. And they want to help you most of the times. They're very uh, abundant minded and they're looking to you know, be a go-giver. And, and especially when you're young or new, they want to help you in any way because typically there was someone there when they first started that was helping them. So there are certain things that like I, I feared, but how I overcame them really were just by, as I mentioned, just taking massive action. I love it. So t- there's two things that I really want to talk about out of what you just said, and then I'm going to get my opinions on them. But yeah. I want to first talk about the lifelong learner thing you were talking about earlier what does that mean to you like to be a lifelong learner like is it just reading books or like is it more than that like what what does it mean because i think that is very critical in your success in being an entrepreneur because you can be i think you could if you eventually if you shut off you mean you'll you'll just stay wherever you are right like if you stop learning and honestly if you stop learning you you're eventually at some point gonna just rip go out of business because things stuff changes over decades and all that type of stuff so just kind of just what's your what does that mean for sure i think to to put it into one simple line and also i want to give you an example of something that i always like to reference when i'm asked this but it's uh, always stay curious right um all the time but there's uh, do you know matthew mcconaughey i'm sure you're familiar with him in his movies Mm -hmm. yeah so he gave a grammy acceptance speech one year i don't know if you have ever seen this video but he was wearing like a white tuxedo and I think the inside was black and he was like the person I want my hero is me in 10 years and every single year that person is still 10 years away so Mm. to me that's exactly how I think like I I never want to stop growing I never want to stop improving and that I never really want I want the gap to remain there and I think people some people might see that as well you're never going to be happy like no I'm happy in the pursuit I think as a man and as a person like my man I just mean person not like the specific person a man right but we were put on the planet to work and to pursue something. And I think that's where I'm the most happy and fulfilled is when I'm working towards something. So when I reach it, I wouldn't want to reach it ever, right? So for me, I break that down in like the more literal and actionable steps by my daily habits. 
So certain things that I do, I read books a lot. I read about 30, at least 30 minutes a day. It's not something I'm trying to grow, but it's just something that I, at least 30 minutes a day. I like to read the Bible. I am very like faithful. So I, I try to have really good conversations with my friends and people as well. I ask for a lot of questions. But on top of that, I'm always watching videos and listening to podcasts, audiobooks. And then in regards to like going to events and conferences, I do certain things like that as well. But I think it's in all, all, all aspects of like, me as a person, I try to do it. So on a spiritual level, intellectual level, whether I'm reading or joining different mastermind groups. And then on top of that, it's really just by having an open mind as well. I think, especially at a young age, but even I think it's harder to have an open mind as you get older, which I'm not old yet, but that's something I always want to make sure I'm intentional with keeping is having that open mind because like, I don't see the point. I think you're just going to like die sooner if you're uh, going into things with a closed mind. I think there's always something that you can learn from someone or some new experience. 100%. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, like, the lifelong learning thing, I mean, it's like I said earlier, like, you're just gonna die unless you like, unless you do, like, what are you what are you living for? If you're not constantly learning? That's the fun of it, right? Like what gets me like, I love the single family space. And I love my wholesaling and my flipping and my buy and holds there. But like, what gets me excited is thinking about like doing what you guys are doing with like the multifamily and trying something new, right? Um, And that lifelong learning process seems like one of the most fun things ever. So my other question from what you had said earlier, I had to do with mentors and like how to find them because I, people constantly ask me that question is like, how do you become my mentor? Or how can you, can you be my mentor? Or like, can, how do I find a mentor or something like that? How, how do you do it? How does yeah, one no, find sure. it? So for me, what the way that we did it was one, I think like just trying to do some type of research on the person. But like the, I approach it with, I would want to take advice from someone that I would trade places with. That's a Dale Carnegie quote, I believe. You know, how to win friends and influence people. And I think mm-hmm. that's where I heard the quote. In that like thought process, you're just trying to find someone that's doing what you it is that you want to do and have some type of proof that they're successful at it. So that was the first step. Now I've had multiple different mentors for different reasons, but I'll talk about my real estate mentors. One of them was a guy named Pace Morby when I was doing single family. Jen, have you heard of him? I'm I'm part of sub two, man. I love oh, Pace Morby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I'm so, part of, yeah, he's yeah, a great yeah. Guy. yeah, he's still a mentor. Obviously, we're not like focused on single family and subject two is hard to do now for our deals, but I learned a lot from him. Multifamily, by the way. I don't know if you've yeah. seen just recent stuff. I'm sure, I'm sure. I haven't, but I'm sure a lot to learn. Anyway, you know, he's he's awesome. Like the way that we found him was just by going on social media social proof, right? We like credited that. And then I'll, I'll transition to my next mentor. Who's my multifamily mentor. Um, his name is Mark Kenny. And the way that we found him was social proof again, but he doesn't have that much of a social presence. So I had to go get referrals for people that have already like worked with him. And I just spoke mm-hmm. with him, found out exactly what I was looking for. And the only, the only way that you actually can learn that is by trying things on, in my opinion, trying things on your own and then seeing, okay, this is what I need because it's not working. So once you know kind of what you're looking for on top of that, by talking to people and asking them what they were looking for in a mentor and why they chose this one, then they can kind of give you an idea as to why they ended up choosing that mentor, giving you the feedback and things like that. But what I look for on top of that is access to the person themselves, certain things where like you're going to have to talk to some coach or something like that. I, I, it's not like a bad thing. I just would rather have the access to the person themselves. As I mentioned, having a good track record and good reputation so you can do all that through social proof. But well, that's if you want to go the route of actually paying for a mentor, which I, I think that's what we do. I mean, a lot of people go to college and spend thousands of dollars on education and they're not willing to buy a pay for a mentor. I, I don't see the thought process there. But for me, that's what we were able to do, thankfully. Um, now, if you're not able to afford a mentor, I think there's still ways that you can you know, find someone who's willing to mentor you. You just have to bring value to them in some way. And you just do that by finding someone that's doing what you want to do. Has that You have that social proof or uh, some type of like, proof that they're doing whatever it is and they're not some like random person but once you identify them try to find a way to bring them value and in exchange maybe that'll offer mentorship but you can find them through social media a local meetup online virtual meetups and things like that and don't be afraid to ask because a lot of people are willing to help yeah 100 percent. i mean that last part is exactly what i tell people it's like you gotta figure out the first step is you're right like first off that you not you need to know what you're looking for like what yeah. you like, need to look for in a mentor is who do you want to be in 10 years? Like what you said earlier, mm-hmm. like that really who you should be looking for. And then two, you got to start looking at yourself. Like what are you, you need to know yourself and what you can add value to them. What are you good at? What are you willing to do? 
Yeah. Right. Like you're like, if I was somebody I, and like, I truly needed a free mentor. I would go to a pace Morby. I'd go to, I'm, what was your mentor's name? Say it again. Yeah. Mark Kenny, Mark Kenny. And I'd be like, Hey man, here's what I can do. Here's how I see it relating to what you're doing right now. I will work for you for free if you're willing to take me on and I'm going to do this. And I see it making you X amount of money in the next six to 12 months. Right. Yeah. Something like that, I think is like the best thing to do where it's worth it. Like that would be worth it to me. If somebody was like, I'm willing to do this, I can set it up for you. I see it making you this much money. Right. And then like, I would naturally train them as that keeps going on. Or you and I did the same route, right? Like I paid for, I'm part of sub two, so are you part of sub two? Is that why, or was Pace more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, See, yeah. He's shaking his head, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so he's shaking his head. Yes. Yeah. So I was, I'm part of that mentorship. And then also I joined one called Astro Flipping. I think it's the quickest way and the easiest way it, because like for me and probably for you, I don't think I could work for somebody ever again. Yeah. Like even it, like in that way, it's like, I'd rather just struggle for a while and then figure it yeah. out. Right. So it depends on the personality, but I'd say just do it like as quickly as you can. When did you get a mentor? Right. Because like it was, was it after your first deal? Was it before? Talk about that a little bit. Question. So like, and I always like to say this, I think you don't have to always know the mentor, even like have like that active relationship and agreement. All the people behind me, they're authors. I view them as my mentors as well through what they've taught and what they teach currently through their content, their books. So a lot of the stuff you can get for free or just by paying a little bit of money to you know, buy their book and you can get mentored by, by them through their books and teachings. So the first mentors I had were the, the authors I was reading. And then on top of that, the courses and the videos I was watching online for free on YouTube and things like that. But then it was about six, seven months into my, my real estate journey when I actually got into sub two. First deal I closed on, I made, as I mentioned, the most money that we made on any deal in the single family space. And immediately I already was watching Pace Morby on YouTube. So I knew where I was going to go. I knew he had a mentorship and I knew how much it costs. I just knew I needed to close on this to afford it. So once I closed on it, I already just knew where I was going, wired it, boom. Then I was into the group and it was a small group at the time, like 200 people. So we had a little bit more access to them at that time. But that's how that's how quickly we were willing to pay money. And I think people are afraid to invest in themselves. And the yeah. one thing I realized is like, you are the commodity, you are the asset, the best asset you can invest in. Um, and you'll never like be able, no one will ever take that from you, the education and the experience. So don't be afraid to do that. I love it. Awesome. Guys, next week, the podcast, it's still going to be at the same time. It's going to be a very interesting one. I'm going to not be on it. I'm going to be in the, I'm already in the Dominican Republic right now. I'm really happy this freaking, this, there wasn't like too much cutting out at all. It was like pretty damn smooth. The fact I have Caribbean internet. I am going to have Munif Saza and Love Francis. I don't know if you know them, Jeffrey. They're, they're more sub two people, but they, they are a husband and wife couple and they're going to interview each other on it. So it's going to be cool. It's going to be an interesting one. Very different talking very getting much more relationshipy and businessy. It's going to be really fun guys. So don't miss that one. That's going to be same time, same it's Thursday, 5 PM PST. It's going to be amazing guys. Thank you so much. I will see you on the next one. Let's go.